Greetings, workers, peasants, and petty bourgeois intellectuals. Welcome to This is Revolution, and my name is Jean Bajalan. In for Jason Miles on this very special White Guy Wednesday. That's right. Every Wednesday, when we can get the white people together, we're not very organized. We take over the This is Revolution channel and white it up, or at least white ethnic it up, I think would be more accurate. Uh, I don't believe anyone on White Guy Wednesday is truly at the core of white supremacy, but we're working hard to get there. You know, no one's changed their surname yet, but give it time. So what is the conversation about today? What are we going to talk about today? Well, what better subject for the white guys to talk about than the glorious successes of Vietnamese socialism? And of course, joining me to talk about Vietnam and the history of Vietnam are, of course, C. Derek Vaughn. How are you doing, C. Derek Vaughn? I'm doing well. How are you guys doing? Ramadan Mubarak and Pesach Shimek, depending on what you need here. What you need, yep. And, of course, he is the whitest of the whites and also uh, a good servant of Vietnamese socialism. He is Deep State Cuba. Deep State Cuba, how are you doing? Hello, everyone. Yeah, nobody specified what deep state I belong to. Exactly. So, uh, it can be a very fluid situation, like gender. Um, oh, let's not get into that. That old. Yeah. What are you trying to do there, Kuba? You, you mentioned the, the 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 G word. The um, gynocracy. The gynocracy. Yeah, that's you just got to span in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> the um, we, uh, I uh, just to get everybody up to speed on what Gene means by that. Um, I spent two years uh, living in Vietnam in Hanoi, um, where I taught um, for a private education center, the New Vietnam, as well as the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam, a state-run school that was uh, founded to provide the Communist Party with specialized uh, foreign uh, area experts as cadres for their diplomatic and, and foreign policy apparatus okay. and um i've kept in touch with uh, some of my students um some of them have done good and are in interesting places um and uh, a couple of weeks ago i texted the group chat um asking them where i was and then i sent a bunch of cheeky and escalating um hanoi socialist um selfies so so for all you mls out there kuba has done more for the cause of marxist leninism than you'll ever do from your bed <laughs> from your bedroom in south uh, the uh, other the other third rail all right we just yeah. keep on bouncing between rails today there we go um, so uh, so kuba is a he's not just a cadre he's the man who trains the cadre of the vietnamese uh, foreign service mostly in diversity equity and inclusion so kuba exactly. i actually interviewed for that school once. Uh, how did it go i uh obviously didn't get the job i ended up in egypt instead but but uh it was pretty interesting so um i don't know what what betrayed me probably they thought it was a trot or something i don't know but uh it's a trot. Well, let's 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 get onto the subject then. So, you know, we've been we've been talking about doing a show on Vietnam for a while. Uh, you know, especially because Cuba had experience uh, in Vietnam, and and is knowledgeable of the story of Vietnamese history and you know ge the general sort of East Asian development state uh, history. So we kind of wanted to talk about Vietnam because I think. I don't know if it's just me, but uh, and it's just my Twitter feed. It seems that Vietnam is almost completely ignored these days, uh, even amongst those people who are "quote unquote" pro real existing, actual existing social people. There's a few people out there. There is um, 
there was just because they're still holding on to sino-soviet split shit like but like that's actually part of it i've seen people pick up 1970s uh cambodia apologia to not talk about vietnam even though there is you know a couple of famous vietnamese uh socialist youtubers out there Uh, yep there are some there is the luna oi luna oi there's a luna oi who does a lot of vietnamese posting so i wanted to kind of open up um uh, and ask you kuba you know when we talk about the modern history of Vietnam, Vietnam, where, where do you like to kind of think about what do you think is the important background we need to know about Vietnam? Well, um, I'm glad you asked that. And one reason why I suggested this topic was also because a great deal of coverage of Vietnamese history, uh, especially in the United States, is through the prism of the Vietnam War. Yep, and generally speaking, um, it just turns into an Asian backdrop for American drama. Um, while baby boom, uh, baby boomer psychodrama. I mean, exactly. The, my uh, uncle fought in the war, so I'm used to it. <laughs> and um, it was a horrendous conflict for those involved mm. in it, and very dislocating and traumatizing for a lot of Americans indeed. But um, of course, Vietnam has its own story and uh, its own particularities that get washed out when you begin with the first GI's landing uh, or the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Um, one, one thing that I like to emphasize when talking about uh, Vietnam from a uh, deep historical perspective is that it is a, uh, it presents itself contemporary Vietnam in ways very similar to the People's Republics of um, the Cold War era. That is, it is a socialist country, a socialist state, but also a nation state along traditional um, European lines, uh, albeit with uh, a number of recognized minorities. I think it's, I think it may be Uh, It's not quite the same level as China, um, but it's still more than you would expect. Um, There are about, um, there are a number of groups that are um, recognized. Uh, 54 is the number. Um, However, they only represent about 15% of the population, uh, less than that. Uh, I think 54 is more than China, actually. How many in China? I don't, well, there's levels in China too, so I should be careful about that. I know there's like the five, the five nations, and then a bunch of subgroups, and I have to 56. look it up. Fifty six. Fifty six. Okay. Yes. The um, and um, so Vietnam again coming in second place to China. Uh, well, I I heard uh, some. Uh, you got yelled at by the PRC representative who keeps you on track i see <laughs> the um <laughs> uh she she threw in 56 before i could look it up but but the headphones prevented me from getting solid intel the first time there you um, go that's my alibi the uh, so um uh, it is overwhelmingly uh king people um which are what we consider ethnic vietnamese um the other there's groups of uh, Cambodians, uh, Han Chinese, as well as uh, a large number of uh, mountain people, um, meaning different villages, communities, um, groups that uh, live in relatively remote areas. A lot of them have um, co-ethnic communities in Laos and uh, China as well. Um, But even the Vietnamese core is uh, that there's a stark cultural divide in the history between north and south um the northern area um, meaning the um, red river delta around hanoi was um originally a um, not originally but um one of the first uh formal polities that emerged was in the red river delta but it quickly came under Chinese influence. And um, there have been frequent 
attempts to incorporate it into China proper. There was a thousand year occupation mm -hmm. um, described from about um, the first century BC to um, around 1000. The South, and it, you can see the influence of uh, yeah, Chinese no, culture everywhere. In the North of Vietnam, the, there's a lot of Chinese cultural influence as well as you have communities from China, uh, particularly Hakka people from mm -hmm. who are not actually, eth you know, the typical ethnic hands, but are a group from southern China that are heavily integrated there. If people remember the Vietnamese uh, boat people, many of those were uh, people with ethnic connections to China, who, when the People's Republic of China uh, tried to invade Vietnam, they ended up leaving as that invasion created certain pressures for groups that were seen as being tied to uh, China. But of course, mm -hmm. as Kuba points out, uh, this, the, the south of Vietnam has less of a direct Chinese cultural influence. And it's important to remember that the Vietnamese language is a distinctive language related to the uh, related to the Asia Pacific languages, I believe related to the uh, Filipino and other, um, um, not Filipino. No, no. The, you're thinking Australonesian languages, yeah. um, Indonesian, Malay, Tagalog, uh, the languages of the Philippines. Um, the Vietnamese belongs to, I believe the Sino-Burman group. Um, right. And, but it is, very, that, it is not mutually intelligible with any dialect of um, of Chinese, and, and it uh, has way more tones in it for one thing, right? It has more tones than um, Mandarin, certainly. I can't, yeah. and more tones than Cantonese, and more tones than Cantonese. Uh, um, yeah, so you're up to like eight then. <laughs> yes, and I believe it is eight. Um, uh, fewer I've tones looked... than Thai, I believe. Yeah, Thai's got a bunch. It is. Yeah. An, it is an. Uh, uh, Austro-Asiatic language. There we go. Austro-Asiatic. Austro-Asiatic. So it is related to uh, Khmer and various other languages in uh, in that region. In, 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 that, in what was once Indochina. Indochina, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. In, and it has the, there are there are related languages in in India, in parts of Burma. Uh, in parts of Malaysia as well. But it's, the point is it's a distinct language, even though it has a lot of influence in terms of vocabulary from the uh, from uh, Chinese as well. So the Vietnamese people, you know, they're, they're, there's a strong cultural tradition there that is distinct from China. It, well, I, I, yeah. I would characterize it a little like um, the Korean Peninsula, okay. where um, there's uh, indigenous you know, pre-Sino, pre-Chinese influence elements. There's uh, localities that, um, local particularities and distinctions that um, have been, you know, continually uh, developed and innovated. Um, but there is a, a very significant overlay of um, things like uh, the original writing system in the north of Vietnam was uh, Chinese characters, a very strong Confucian tradition. Um, the North is also where uh, Mahayana style yeah. Buddhism is practiced, whereas the South Stuff is Theravada. I mean, Vietnam precisely. is the only country that I know of <laughs> that has both indigenous uh, Mahayana and Theravada uh, native traditions that have to get along. And the reason um, is that um, there were essentially two political centers that were stitched together. Uh, the North, which uh, had this very long uh, relation and conflictual, uh, but also um, fruitful relationship with China. Um, and that border between Vietnam and China was um, something uh, much more porous and tenuous in uh, the pre-modern period than it is now. Um, and Southern China, where uh, Southern Vietnam, which was uh, originally uh, the sort of mother civilization in that region was the Champa kingdom, which was a Hindu Buddhist um, Southeast Asian um, society. I, that one is uh, much more closely related to the traditional cultures of Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, 
at different points in the, um, you know, uh, from 1000 to 1800, um, there was the incorporation of uh, increasing sections of the South into uh, polities that were centered in the North. And that led to the incorporation of the people living there um, into a Vietnamese national identity, as well as a large scale migration of uh, Vietnamese from uh, the North to the areas uh, opened up in the South. Uh, the South right now is one of the agricultural breadbaskets of the entire, on, on a planetary scale, mm -hmm. a major exporter of uh, rice um, all over Asia, all over the world. Um, that development, while the area is fertile and well-watered because of the Mekong Delta, um, it really took off um, once irrigation works, dams and paddies had been built on that land, um, which for a long time had not only been contested militarily, making it difficult to settle, uh, but also had the typical um, river delta problems of uh, you know flooding, uh, malaria, etc. Um, now, contemporary Vietnam is still um, somewhat polarized. There's a Hanoi center in the north where the capital was located, uh, which was the uh, capital of the, the communists. Um, People's Republic of Vietnam that uh, eventually reunified the country uh, and Ho Chi Minh City in the south, formerly Saigon, which is significantly larger in terms of population, um, significantly richer, uh, the site of um, most of the foreign investment uh, and a lot of the economic growth that's been powering the uh, Vietnamese economy. Um, the There's an uneasy coexistence between the two. Um, the elite in the South, um, they were associated with the American occupation. And uh, one reason why the city has taken on more of a commercial um, orientation is that if you're if you were from the South, it was more difficult to get into the uh, networks and establish the kind of relationship um of trust and get your uh, security bona fides to serve in the vietnamese government in any major capacity so, so can i ask a little bit about that um is it like we're i think we're gonna use the korean peninsula a lot as our contrast point because it, i know it very well and i think there's been a lot of american travelers there that can kind of understand the contrast point but is it similar to to uh to like chosan korea uh, where there was there was a division culturally even before um, it became geopolitically split. Is that also playing there? I mean, like for example, um, and this may be the opposite of, uh, of Vietnam, but in Korea, for example, the South was was very Buddhist and the North was very, uh, believe it or not, Christian. In fact, the Christians played a big role in the early communist movement there. Um, and then they defected later. Um, so is there a similar division there? Or is that like artificial and being opposed by us after the war? You know, what? Well, well, there's um, there's a great deal of localism within okay. Vietnam. The. We've only been talking about uh, Ho Chi Minh City and Hanoi, but. Uh, Vietnam has maybe a dozen medium sized cities that have been um, the centers of small and medium-sized polities that have some um, legitimate claim to being a, a political center or a cultural center, um, Hue being one, um, one of the most obvious, but um, there's, a, there's a number. And uh, Vietnamese, similar to uh, Chinese, similar to Koreans, um, they, even after migrating to big cities and mm -hmm. sort of becoming uh, residents there, uh, still talk about their hometown, still talk about their family connections in that uh, from that location. And it's consequential where you're from. Mm -hmm. And uh, the um, so that localism exists even beyond the north south 
um, division and the north south divide um, some of it um, there's significant cultural salience to that difference i mean the mahayana theravada uh, and, division and the, is alone and there's a there's a kind of historical precedent to both this both the decentralized nate you know the the multiple cultural centers that exist in vietnam but also the existence of a pan vietnamese identity <clears throat> because you know if you look at the history of vietnam and cuba probably knows this better than i do you know you have uh, this long period in which you know the core centers of northern vietnam are under um uh, under chinese uh, rule but you know around the year 1000 you have the kind of uh, restoration of a vietnamese state but th this isn't a continuous state there there are various periods of decentralization there are uh, collapses multiple kingdoms across this territory and it's really only at the beginning of the 19th century uh, that vietnam is unified largely on the mm. territorial basis that we know today so there was the great viet state which was uh, a relatively new state in in southeast asia uh, formed around the beginning of the 19th century which basically brought most of what we think of as Vietnam under the control of a single uh, monarchical regime. Uh, and it was this state that eventually came into con uh, conflict with the French Empire uh, in what, the 18, I want to say the 1860s. Basically, oh. Napoleon, Napoleon <clears throat> the third, one of his projects was the conquest and colonization of vietnam although it, it, um, there were antecedents to that going all the way back to louis the 16th um jesuit missionaries were active in southeast asia um the, not only in the south there were populations of converts uh, in uh northern urban centers as well um and one of the claimants for the Vietnamese Imperial Sea reached out to, in a moment of utter desperation, uh, the French for um, subsidies and support oh, yeah, uh, in mistake. defeating the the Taysan Rebellion. Uh, the it was a bit of a bullet dodged because the French Revolution put the kibosh on any uh, possible French intervention uh, for this on behalf of their clients, uh, but the um it's older than the um official move towards uh, french interference predates napoleon the, uh, the third uh is where i was going yeah so, uh, so so again just to contrast with korea because i know it better this is actually almost the opposite where you have a large you had three separate kingdoms it became one large kingdom that was parceled up over 400 years so choson is uh uh, broken up in the into first two parts. Uh, uh, Silla. Uh, uh, well, no, no, no. Silla is before that. Shosan is after. Um, so you have had the unification of like the Silla, the Bakje, uh, etc. Um, and it's interesting because while regionalism is super important to Koreans, there's not any real memory of like ethnic difference between the Silla and the Bakje and and, uh, and any of that. Um, but today, like you have uh, Yum Bion, uh, 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 it's how it's pronounced in Korean. I don't know how to pronounce it in Chinese, sorry. But the Korean Autonomous Prefecture, which goes back to like 1640 or so, uh, like the end of the Ming. Um, and then, it get, you know, K Korea just gets more and more chopped up o o over time. Um and it doesn't. It sounds like the opposite with Vietnam, where you have many small regional cultures being pushed together over, over a long period of time. Yeah, um, I, I would say that that uh, that's a pretty good contrast. The process actually wasn't completed until um, the disintegration of uh, French Indochina. Uh, mm. There were regions of contemporary Vietnam which had been ethnically mixed and. Um, when it was administered as one French colonial polity, um, 
although there were separate courts in uh, Laos, uh, more than one in Vietnam and um, a king in Cambodia, uh, there was one French administration for Indochina and a single Indochinese budget. Um, the uh, it was that erased some of the salience of the, the difference between Cambodian land, Vietnamese land. Um, and at the end of the war, uh, the borders between Cambodia and Vietnam were reworked with the incorporation of territory that had been part of the Khmer Empire uh, historically into um, contemporary Vietnam. And this was the Mekong Delta, uh, incidentally, which uh, is such a consequential rice producing region now. Bit of so a what, chalice with global warming, but we can talk mm, about that later. So, I mean, so uh, what would you say the significant points of the, you know, we often hear about the American uh, intervention and, you know, we don't really want to focus on that so much tonight. But the French literally talking. ruled, the French ruled this place from the 1860s until 1954. Uh, so that is a significant uh, historical period. What would you say the prime influence of that French rule, of the consequence of French rule, uh, the colonial administration on Vietnam and as well as the rest of Indochina? The, um, the consequences were considerable. Um, first of all, the movement towards uh, using the Latin alphabet um, as the primary means of writing Vietnamese, the introduction of newspapers using um, uh, the Latin alphabet, uh, the contemporary Vietnamese adapted Latin alphabet. Um, that without French uh, occupation, it's difficult to see how that same process could have taken place indigenously. The um, French, uh, one way to gauge the level of uh, transformation that the French had induced is to look at the nature of the Vietnamese resistance to colonial rule across that span of time. It's almost uh, about a hundred years of um, French occupation. At the beginning, um, the uh, re rebellions uh, that occurred were tied to particular military clans um, or notable families that had nationalistic um, uh, claims to leadership. Um, they were done in the name of establishing a new dynasty or um, pushing the French out and Meiji style, um, empowering the emperor that uh, that was in place because um, the French uh, opted to maintain um, the monarchies inside of Indochina and, uh, and rule through them parallel style. Uh, there were conspiracies of um, court mandarins, you know, um, traditional East Asian bureaucrats, uh, and uh, other types of um, very other types of um, resistance that came from traditional groups grounded yeah. in this imperial society. Then around the turn of the century, it changes and you get the nationalists, you get the students, you get um, resistance in that Western idiom. And that period is also when the greatest French investments are being made um, in uh, the factory, um, industrialization, infrastructure, uh, agriculture as well. It's the French that build the, uh, the first um, unified uh, irrigation works, modern irrigation works in the Mekong Delta, opening up um, vast uh, areas of land for rice cultivation. Uh, they also introduce the French uh, French style education geared specifically towards uh, Vietnamese. Uh, with World War One and the massive drain on French labor that accompanies the the bleeding attritional war and fought on the Western Front. Uh, the French Empire taps into Vietnamese labor even more aggressively in two ways. One, it increases the formal extraction out of um, 
Indochina, forcing things like, you know, contributions in money and in material from um, the Indochinese uh, population, but it also um, mobilizes about 100,000 or more uh, Vietnamese laborers for uh, and soldiers and other uh, cadres to um, travel outside of Vietnam, outside of Indochina, uh, some to Europe, many end up seeing Paris, like the, the famous American Doughboys, how are you going to keep them on the farm after they've seen Paris? Um, and this exposure to the rest of the world, uh, facilitated by the French education that uh, some of them had received before leaving, um, really shifts the, uh, the tone of the culture in a way similar to the, the Meiji Restoration in, China, uh, in Japan, that you go from having a um, fundamentally traditional um, society resisting foreign um, foreign oppression and foreign invasion to a uh, mobilization, mobilized nationalist, um, you know, quote unquote, modern society looking for its own uh, national story, uh, self-determination and an end to exploitation, beginning to use the language of um, European human rights, democracy, and of course, socialism as well. And you know this is this is a uh, you know the classic contradiction of colonial rule often is that it brings about the very sociological changes within society that make its rule untenable because a lot of these traditional rebellions were regional, fractional, class related. They did not have the strength or uh, of uh, popular support or widespread support of the country to resist French rule. However, the, the, the transformations brought by colonial rule, however, you know, exploitative and deformed they might be, created the sociological basis for a mass political movement and one that could turn the very weapons, the ideological sort of weapons of European civilization against European civilization. Uh, it's no accident. I believe Ho Chi Minh, you know, was uh, inspired in and, and inspired by the First World War. The yeah. Vietnamese, uh, you know, when uh, the the Wilson's fourteen points and the idea of national self determination came out, Ho Chi Minh and Vietnamese nationalists was like, well, you know, we're a, a nation, <clears throat> and we should have self determination. Of course, this was. Uh, uh, put on the back burner, but even by 1918, colonialism was on the way out, and you could tell it was on the way out because they had to f make up an entirely new thing called a mandate instead of a colony when they wanted to parcel out new empires. So, you know, the, the empires had with them uh, transformed these societies uh, and furnished them with the tools to resist. Uh, Western rule. I, uh, before we get too all first internationally on, on, on things, I do think it's interesting how we have to, um, how many parallels let's see with this and like, say Nigeria, um, where, uh, I keep on thinking about, uh, when we talk about like, uh, national liberation and decolonial struggles. Um, the the ironies pointed out by Chinua Achibe about how the national form is a European form and decolonization and, uh, has to accommodate for that, even though um, that it is it is a foreignly imposed form. Um, and the unifying language or language unification is based off of European praxis and stuff like that. But we shouldn't, you know, basically we shouldn't cede that to the Europeans or cede it to colonialism, um, that we can do it our own way. And that, that's an interesting de debate in, in, uh, in Africa. And I think it's, it's, I think it's interesting to me that socialism, and I, 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 I'm actually saying this to the benefit of socialism, 
But socialism you know, helped unify things in a way that you don't have the same debates over. I'm not saying that there aren't debates over regional cultures. I actually just don't. I can't speak to that. Actually, I don't know. Um, but you don't have like we're not reading about the same kinds of debates uh, coming out of Vietnam, even with those, you know, na uh, regional ethnicities and, and internal uh, differences as we are in say Nigeria. And would you think, do you think that socialism like helps with that? Or is there something else going on there? Or was it the French? I don't know. I mean, it, like, was it a French administrative tactic that backfired? There's a lot of different theses that you can run. I mean, I would like to know could, what, like, could... Vietnamese people think about that. One thing that I would point out and, and I'll let Cuba answer that point is that, you know, when compared to, you know, Vietnam had a relatively long pre-colonial history of statehood of some kind of concept of a Vietnamese state, whereas mm -hmm. in Nigeria... In opposition to a Chinese state. In opposition. Whereas in Nigeria, Nigeria is welded together out of a number of different polities and kingdoms, uh, purely according mm -hmm. to the, the dictates of European colonial rule. Whereas the French, and Cooper points this out, you know, they occupied the Vietnamese Empire and they they did what they did. You know, it, it's less uh, a Nigeria, more of a Morocco slash Tunisia experience okay. where, or, or an Egypt experience where the, the, the elements of the indigenous ruling class remain the, in office. And the Nigeria uh, comparison, it is... Um, much more accurate to Indochina as a whole, mm -hmm. because gotcha. that is a welded together collection of um, different yeah. kingdoms, polities, Myanmar, ethnic groups. Uh, oh, Vietnam, uh, Thailand, Cambodia. Cambodia. It, it was just Cambodia, Laos, Laos and, and Vietnam. Vietnam. Although the Vietnam itself was comprised of three provinces, um, and there was some diversity uh, within. Uh, among them. Two of them were ruled by a Vietnamese emperor. Um, I think the third one had a lower level uh, monarch, and uh, that was in the southern part of uh, Vietnam, heavy Chinese influence as well, because um, the there's a very long history of the Chinese minority in Vietnam, and they've played different roles at different times. And it's not all Hakka people in the north, but um, Southern oh, no, Vietnam was an extension of what could be called the Straits Chinese settlement. Um, uh, Hoi An, like Hoi An, and and uh, the uh, point south, the, yeah, the the Hainese, I think. Mm. Okay, and uh, the those are very old communities mm -hmm. that have, um, despite the fact that um, Vietnamese culture is one which you can very easily adapt to um, beginning with the, the Chinese education um, as opposed to Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, where there are much greater hurdles uh, culturally. Gotcha. Uh, the uh, Chinese minority, well, we never hear about the people who assimilate because they assimilate. Right. Um, but there had been a consistent minority uh, that maintained endogamy um, and a uh, separate way of life uh, from the Vietnamese that occupied a kind of comprador mercantile position. Um, someone in the chat compared them. Similar to Jews. Not dissimilar, okay. but... Um, as a the, Jew, I can say that. So it's okay, Cuba. You don't have to worry about I, it. I, as a Paul, Cuba can't say that. <laughs> the, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just very careful. Just very careful. Also... Um, the relationship, th there wasn't the same blood libel bullshit uh, that the Chinese oh, had good, to deal good. with. Um, that, that said, you could still get pogroms and annihilationism, but um, the that kind of you killed our god thing um, wasn't part of uh, the tension between the two groups. Um, in any case... Um, the reason why you know you have a more successful embrace a more successful uh, way to handle and administer diversity um 
compared to a country like Nigeria, first of all, 85% of the population are king. That's more than there are white people in the United States. So mm -hmm. um, there are minorities, but it's not, um, it's not like India or Nigeria where the best you can do is a plurality and everyone has their own different story about who they are and um, what their history means. Instead, you have one dominant group and then a carve out for the 15%. Um, and because of the relatively late independence, a relatively late decolonization of Vietnam and the specific ways in which it happened um, through a war of national liberation and heavy um, coordination and cooperation with the Soviet Union, when Vietnam uh, regains independence, it has a choice of previously developed um, political structures and forms, political technologies, if you will, um, on how to address uh, the uh, coexistence between ethnic groups in a multi-ethnic state. And they adopted the Soviet model. Um, you recognize ethnicities, you provide certain uh, forms of uh, mostly symbolic self-government, but also opportunities for advancement within the party. Um, you also keep an eye on some of the groups because um, <coughs> during the Vietnam War, the um, different communities had different orientations. Some were pro-communist, uh, the especially uh, the relationship between uh, Northern Vietnamese and um, Laotians very strong, uh, remain strong to this day. But some groups were hostile to communism um, and actively suborned by first the French and later the Americans into um, serving as auxiliaries uh, in the fight against um, uh, Vietnamese. Were there like traditional class, uh, class relationships associated with these groups or was it ethnic what's going on there i mean i know a little bit about the Hmong, but like it was mainly that um the the, the french called them montagnards mm -hmm. there's a number of different uh, smaller ethnic groups that inhabit the highlands of vietnam mm -hmm. and their experience of um vietnamese polity vietnamese people almost full stop was uh, bureaucrats and officials from the center coming in to interfere, to try to take their land, to try to limit their grazing rights, to try to pre prevent them from migrating from place to place, uh, plus the imposition of uh, borders between territories like uh, Laos and um, Vietnam or China and Vietnam. Uh, so get in the people. way. Precisely. Yeah. And if it's a little like, Imagine Appalachian people in a hundred years ago, right? It or doesn't matter yesterday. who you are. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter who you are. If you're stepping in and you're interfering with their way of life, they won't like you and um, it won't be hard to uh, talk mean, them into violent resistance. This is part of uh, the region known as, that's being called Zomia, the kind of, uh, uh, the mountainous region of Asia where you have many different ethnic communities, many of whom are actually migrated from lowlands to the highlands specifically to escape the authority of states in the lowlands as well. So, so like Asian West Virginia. Yeah, pretty much. And um, also armed opium. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. So, so a lot like Appalachia. The, um, yeah. except that they're producers, not consumers. <laughs> Fair enough. The, um, uh, so that was another point of contention. Um, one of the easiest and most lucrative cash crops available in the mountainous regions was opium. Um, and the Vietnamese, Vietnamese governments, whether imperial, whether um, socialist, uh, even the Republic of Vietnam in the South, made efforts to try to stamp out, limit, or control the opium trade. And that was another way, that was a material way in which um, you're interfering with the livelihood of uh, the Montagnard uh, groups. So many of them worked with the United States and many of them paid a heavy price uh, for doing so. 
uh, that demonstration effect um, on the one hand, if you organize, you mobilize as an ethnic community against socialist Vietnam, um, you'll lose and there will be a price to pay versus there's also carve outs. There's also opportunities available for you. Um, there is nominally uh, legal protections. And if you can get into the right circle of um, cadres and um, the, the right levels of political influence, then you can protect yourself in your community within the system that's provided. It's not like, um, it's not so there, a king supremacist state. So so this is a, a very much a, a, a multinational nation state. Like. Yes, it's the, the same template as China, the same template as the former Soviet Union, right. um, albeit since the scale is much smaller, they don't, you don't have the layer cake of- um, Different levels of, of autonomy. Precisely. Right, and, yeah, and, you don't have nested autonomy. And, uh, you know, when they do it right, one thing that I think the Soviet model from which everybody is drawn does, at least for a time, it does provide, like, less violent mechanisms to deal with ethnic diversity than in many even liberalish uh, states as well. It doesn't mean it's a panacea to all their problems, but it, it does provide a meaningful template for the resolution of ethnic national difference although uh paradoxically these kind of things also serve to reify those differences when you know when you you know often the boundaries between identity are quite fluid but you know once you start creating bureaucratic structures to administer that diversity once there's a label in your id exactly once you have to put down whether you're a or b then you have to make a decision on whether you're a or b uh, when you previously could feel like A sometimes, but maybe you felt like B when it was the cool yeah. festival. But, um, and, but and yeah, the, the ethnic differences um, become salient in the sort of post-independence years, mainly around uh, geopolitical points of tension. So yeah, like Cambodia, Cambodia and the People's Republic of China. Um, yeah. Well, let's let's uh, let's uh, skip the American part of the Vietnam let's, War. Let's, yeah, let's part. let's skip. We all know America was pretty nasty. Tried oh, to yeah. I do have um, some war stories from um, a Vietnamese veteran who um, served in the war. Um, a couple of um, clever ways that they came up with to shoot down American B-52s with um, outdated and limited technology. Oh yeah, uh, go ahead. Let's let's hear how they did it. So um, the, in order to, to shoot them down, um, you had a very limited window um, in which um, you could activate radar and start to track the planes um, and then uh, before that radar would trigger um, defensive capabilities on the planes and they'd bomb it and, and terminate you. You couldn't have permanent radar installations because there was no way to, to protect them from American air power. But you had about four minutes. For four minutes, you were okay. And uh, the Vietnamese discovered that when there was a major American push to bomb targets in Haiphong or in Hanoi or other parts of the North, um, the American Air Force would use the same routes and the same schedules every day. <laughs> of um, course we did. <laughs> and you could track them, um, how they would come in uh, in order to uh, attack the city because a Soviet sub off the coast of the Philippines was monitoring takeoff and landing from American bases there. They alert um, Vietnamese forces. Um, the Vietnamese already have guns and uh, surface to air missiles along the route um, that the um, American planes are going to take. And with the timing and the regularity of American bombings, you just um, wait until four minutes before they bombed you last time, 
you turn on your um, radar systems and you fire all of your guns massed in a, in a single kill box. And that is how you can um, shoot down uh, American planes with uh, under get desperate yourself, get disadvantages. Yourself a, get yourself a John McCain. Exactly. That's how you get yourself a John McCain. That's how you get yourself a jo John McCain. So, and man, they man, went man. easy on that John McCain. And, they and went easy also, on uh, Americans were shocked when they were started losing planes because they were convinced that they could jam any type of radar signal that was mm -hmm. um, NATO, Warsaw Pact, doesn't matter, full spectrum. Um, at the uh, my my contact told me that um, he was talking to an American uh, military officer decades later, and he was asked, like, how did you guys how did you guys get us with the missiles? We thought that we were jamming all frequencies. We had every, we had specs for every single uh, radar platform, and we had, we had figured it all out. He's like, uh, "Well, when when did you start your uh, catalog?" Well, 1945. Every single post-war model, every single country, we were jamming it. And um, then the Vietnamese officer leaned forward and said, uh, "You know, we had an old Nazi." radar station from 1944. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, my, I'll give a little bit of, of a bit of context I discovered when I was living in, in, in Iraq. My, my uh, uncle, as I mentioned, fought in the war. Um, my father's a little bit too young. And, well, was a little bit too young. He's very dead now. Um, the the my my uncle married a korean woman hence my ties to korea that's how i got so ensconced in korean culture but i didn't discover till i was over there and mistakenly talked to someone about it about what he was actually doing which he was working with uh chim uh, chim young shin's division which was a division of republic of korean soldiers who we basically had as the war crimes division um not that Americans didn't do enough of their own, but whenever they wanted to do something really nasty, they would often work with South I mean, Korean even, soldiers. Even the Third Reich used Ukrainian auxiliaries for their right. Dirty work. Right. So it it, it was uh, when I when I the one time I've been to Hanoi and and went and talked to people, I was surprised. I don't know what I was expecting. I was expecting a little bit more anti-American cinnamon. I got way more in Japan and Korea than I did in Vietnam. Ironically, I guess you know winning helps, right? Yeah, winning um, helps. <laughs> um, um, but when I mentioned that, that was where I saw real anger. Was there was a lot of anger at the Koreans, um, and um, I met one of the soldiers when I was living in Korea. Who it was old man, and we used. It, I taught English to old people on the side, and like made money that way, and actually usually just got paid in alcohol. But, uh, yeah, I mentioned my uncle once, and that did not go well. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting now because there's also a whole lot of uh, a lot of Korean men go to Vietnam to try to marry um, for some reason. Um, it, and so there there's a lot of tensions there. And. Um, but it was, it, it was interesting to me that there was more anger when I talked about the, the, the Korean participation than there was at me as an American when I was in Hanoi, which I was surprised at because we, I mean, one of the things I will say, we still saw people who were affected by Agent Orange, like this was only what, 13 years ago, 14 years ago. It wasn't that long ago. And you still see people who are being born with, with birth defects related to it. It's, it's real fucking sad. No, I'd be more pissed off. <laughs> the, um, it also uh, the, the United States has benefited tremendously from the fact that the traditional neighborhood bully China stepped up basically immediately right, to launch and... a post-war war uh, mm -hmm. in order to protect the Khmer Rouge of, of all causes in the beginnings of the Sino-Soviet split times which you know world historic tragedy right there well, the um, and as a result, like first of all, you win 
Second of all, um, you have a, another target, one that you're much actually more habituated to hating than um, than the United States. Although and, even the, even though we did help the Chinese with the Khmer Rouge too, or the Khmer Rouge, how, how do you pronounce that? Yeah, but the but not a lot. In, also, <laughs> in Vietnam is just like America is just like any other country. When you look at the the mass of the population. Uh, the level of interest in politics and the level of kind of granular awareness of who did what, Fair. which war crime, you know, falls in which bucket uh, gets lost. And you just bright have colors them. go first. Yeah, got it. Yeah. <laughs> and um, another thing that the United States benefits from, um, all Westerners benefit from, is that um, even at the height of the a war with the United States and France, um, socialist internationalism meant that there were also sympathetic Westerners, um, you know, Western faces mm -hmm. that were part of the Jane, Jane Fonda, Jane Fonda, J exactly right there. Um, the that's not lost on, um, the Vietnamese public and the, especially given the, the reality of um, its geopolitical vulnerability to China um, and uh, Vietnam isn't close to becoming an, another South Korea or, or getting enmeshed in, uh, you know, a NATO for Asia, which is what some neocons have been discussing, but it seeks a, um, balanced policy you know um of cultivating a good relationship with both countries and not taking any and uh, not making any first moves that would compromise their security interests um the there is there remains a, a profound concern about um chinese intentions um and a balancing act uh, of how to benefit economically from um, trade with China and from integration into supply chains, um, regional supply chains, which go through China um, without uh, sacrificing um, political autonomy um, or uh, incurring um, too much of an obligation to Beijing where um, it begins to be a coercive relationship rather than a pragmatic arrangement well we're coming up against the hour and maybe I think we, we should actually pivot to vietnamese socialism yeah, yeah maybe about vietnamese socialism the, yeah. the actual topic of the show well let's talk about yeah let's talk about vietnamese socialism vietnam was unified after this extensive uh struggle uh for national liberation uh under the vietnamese communist party uh, in 1975 and since then they have had to transform from being a resistance economy into a regular economy that can deliver goods and services for its population maintain its legitimacy all those things that it needs uh, needs to do and in recent years vietnam has been doing quite well in the development story of things um, so yeah, Cuba, perhaps we can kind of finish this discussion to talk about what has Viet, what model has Vietnam followed following 19, or really following 1980 with the end of the war with China as well. Uh, what have they been doing to rebuild their society after decades of war? So during the conflict, you, the overwhelming emphasis was on uh, national defense and you had a command economy geared towards the production of uh, armaments and the um, provision of a, a large military that was necessary to um, secure Vietnamese independence. And that was an extraordinarily lengthy pro uh, process which um, mobilized uh, millions, uh, tens, of, um, you know, maybe a dozen million more um, people directly 
into uh, you know war fighters, uh, guerrillas in the south, um, political cadres, uh, key production groups. Uh, for instance, uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail um, was also a pipeline, and you had engineers going in um, to build uh, along the entire track from um, North Vietnam all the way to the Mekong Delta. Um, uh, first a, a dirt road, then a gravel road, then um, a single pipeline uh, until you ended up uh, at the eve of uh, the North Vietnamese uh, offensive into South Vietnam, uh, four pipelines carrying fuel to supply mechanized forces for the attack. So the, the level of engineering, the level of um, manpower and material demand going into this conflict was transformative of the society. Um, the North much, and this also creates a, a social division between Northerners and Southerners. Northerners were subject to um, national defense discipline, which sucks. It is not fun. You might get killed and um, you make do with what's given to you and you have very strict expectations, uh, orders that you need to carry out. Um, Southerners that managed to avoid conscription, that managed to get, you know, scrape up some money, could live, you know, a consumer hedonistic lifestyle, could live um, away from the conflict, away from the war. So there was a bit of payback when, um, after unification, um, the nationalization of land, the nationalization of businesses, um, takes place in the transition towards a Soviet-style um, command economy. The This is also a period where um, political control is at its most severe in Vietnam. Um, difficult to get in, difficult to get out. You have boat people fleeing. Um, people are legitimately uh, concerned for their own, for their lives. Um, because of the uh, security, uh, right, intelligence gathering, anti-subversion efforts, uh, whatever you want to call them, but uh, moves against people perceived to be domestically domestic enemies or whose loyalty was questionable, uh, sometimes applied to entire groups like um, the ethnic Chinese after um, China's intervention, um, or ethnic Khmer uh, during the conflict with the Khmer Rouge. Mm -hmm. The in 1986, um, there's the first moves towards um, the liberalization of economic controls away from the strict Soviet Gos plan, um, four year plan um, system to a socialist market economy. First, without um, legalizing private enterprises, but by 1990, they, they do that. And just as the Soviet Union gave them a, gave Vietnamese socialists a template for political administration, the pri uh, previous attempts, uh, previous efforts at economic liberalization uh, in the People's Republic of China gave them a template for economic reform. Yeah. And even Vietnamese themselves um, that, you know, are nerdy enough to go deep. On, on this kind of stuff, will acknowledge that um, if you want to figure out what Vietnamese economic policy will look like five years from now, um, see what China is doing now, today. Um, I don't know. I, I imagine that there's going to be, there's a decoupling um, due to some of the bolder moves by Xi Jinping. I'd be surprised if um, Vietnam has a replay of that centralization of, of power. Um, but in terms of the relationship between state owned enterprises and export oriented industry, the encouragement of FDI, um, the growth of the private economy, there are uh, very many similarities with uh, China. Um, and one of them is actually that the prior command period, which had things like the distribution of housing, the uh, elimination of landlords, the general education, um, mm -hmm. general infrastructure improvements, 
ironically, that period of high socialism creates the conditions for excellent growth under a more market driven system. I mean, and uh, what you <laughs> and um, and people miss someone, that out, but it's it's but it's it's a hundred. I mean, like like you know, that's what Stalin really invented was a developmental policy. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, he, but not the off ramp. Right. No. No, he didn't. Uh, and also, he didn't really develop the uh, developmental policy he adopted. He just did what the left opposition said they were going to do, and, and did it bloodily and clumsily. And well, in yeah, some yeah. ways, in some ways, um, the current period of Vietnamese economic policy can be thought of as their nep years. Right. Right. That. Just, um, yeah, just like China poor, can be started. Of their exactly. Nep years. Exactly. We are, un, you know, we're, um, to borrow a term from the libertarians, we're going to unleash the market, but on a leash. We'll, on, exactly. Yeah. We're, we're going to untie like the leash a little bit. Yeah. Really what we're going to do. I mean, I mean, we've discussed this before, but I think all three of us uh, are sympathetic to Bukharanite like market socialism as a, as a method of development, you know, people get and, mm -hmm. i mean like you know like you said for very particular uh periods in countries histories you know having the kind of highly uh centralized command economy system gets your basic infrastructure up to a level from which you can do something else in a way that other developmental programs just don't seem to be able to do. Well, yeah, particularly anyone, any neoliberal one that the West is selling after the 1970s. Yeah. I mean, it's just like that would just open your your economy up to be, I to mean, be the, 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 parasitized. The, the American system of making your country succeed is called just like dumping a load of money in it and then giving you the co-prosperity sphere that you wanted in the first place, right? <laughs> I mean, the only way that like Korea was able to, so Republic of Korea was able to do it was uh, doing to Bangladesh what the United States tried to do to it. Um, uh, you know, that's when, particularly after the the garment um, industry in Korea was heavily tariffed, they were just they went to Bangladesh and established factories to get around it, based off what America did to to them. Yeah. So it's it's you know I, I, I it's definitely a better path to go through this way. I I, I do want to I, I do want to ask you a little bit. Um, well, it, it's Cuba. actually still a similar. Um, the difference you still need the export markets. There's yes, no you, getting you around definitely that. Need, you have to have export markets. There's, you have there to have no export markets because of the technological gap, right? Like you can't get ahead without. Um, whatever the uh, strategic technology is of the day. And it's usually the, the Westerners who have it. Um, one of the great shifts in geopolitics is the fact that China right now has enough technology that there is no technological disadvantage anymore. There's right. uh, an unevenness to Chinese technology, um, but uh, it can offer the same deal as the West does. And it doesn't really need um, the full suite of uh, Western technologies anymore. It's internalized, most of them. Uh, Vietnam is about five, 10 years behind that. Um, but the um, to, to give a little bit more credit to uh, South Korea, um, they, the TVs they make themselves, right? Like there is a great deal of technological no, innovation. They're, they're specialized. They they're specialized. Economy. Yeah. They're specialized. <laughs> tech is made there. Yes. Um, they're they're but their Che balls. It got a lot of the base for that by going to, to even, even lesser developed markets and developing that using that money to funnel into high value technological markets, uh, trying to outprice compete the Japanese into the U S and European markets and then building up from there. Right. That would, they had a long-term strategy. It was very, very innovative. I was going to ask you though, that, um, we don't hear a whole lot about Ho Chi Minh thought for one, for some reason it's not popular in the West. Like even Juice gets more, I don't know why, but even Juice gets more, uh, um, uh, you popular press, but I, I want to Anva Haja gets more popular press. These yeah, days. that's weird. It's just it, it's like so. You're not you Anva know. pilled. You're not Anva pilled. No, I'm not. I'm not Hoja pilled. No. 
Um, the although I mean we'd all have to shave, so only Cuba would be okay, and 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 Hoja's Albania. Um, but Ho, Ho Chi Minh is interesting to me. It wasn't codified till after he was dead, and I think it's actually kind of kind of interesting that it's codified in 1991 when they kind of saw that the Soviet Union was gonna not belong for the world so they came up with their own ideological strain um and i think it's interesting what they include in it because they just want to like look at what they formally see as the five things that contribute to ho chi minh thought marxism leninism and one party state traditional vietnamese ideology and culture eastern cultural thought confucianism and buddhism in specific uh however they like they actually want to incorporate French and American political philosophy and Ho Chi Minh's personal nationalist morality. Yeah. Um, that, and I mean, there you go. Um, <laughs> it's not based. Right. right? Like, it, like it, it likes like admitting that, that, fr that the French and American uh, political philosophy, even though it was colonial and terrible was a country, uh, country to their, I, I mean, culture, Ho Chi, it's not Ho something they love. When the Vietnamese, when the Vietnamese uh, communists declared independence in '45, they deliberately drew on, like good Marxists, drew on the American Revolution for their discourse. And indeed, uh, Ho Chi Minh um, and the Viet Minh collaborated with. Uh, that's a poor choice of words. They cooperated with um, Allied forces during World War II mm -hmm. as an anti-Japanese resistance. Right and with fdr so the chinese too so yes <laughs> and with fdr um and this is why his um death um might be a, a great hinge point and with his anti-colonial orientation um ho chi Minh was very much hoping to reach a deal with the americans the, ease the french on out um and we'll have you know some kind of european style social democracy right like we're willing to stand in elections against um traditional forces or some kinds of some conservative groups or, or neoliberals and let the chips fall where they may like once yeah hmm? yeah i think it's interesting actually for all the marxist hatred of capitalism they probably are they probably thought we have more faithfulness to our bourgeois revolution than we ever did oh absolutely like like, yeah. it's kind of funny. <laughs> like, like, um, <laughs> so, yeah the the idea that um, the idea that it really was just hollow rhetoric. Um, I mean, even if it was completely hollow, the fact of deposing a king and creating a popular uh, republic based on popular sovereignty, however debased was an, a radical break for the day uh that's another thing that we have difficulty um difficulty empathizing with right um vietnam and a number of other countries went from poland went from feudalism to socialism yeah. um and not through its own um domestic process but because of um, the clash of larger geopolitical forces. And that feudalism was, it was a lot to, it produced a great hangover. Um, and to this day, there's an ambivalence in Vietnam about how much of the pre-French uh, cultural, political, social legacy is, is worth preserving is worth trying to restore and how much of it is like kind of embarrassing at this point and it's a good thing that um, we left that behind there's also a great appetite for syncretism um religiously so uh, unlike the soviet union though and and uh the and 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 the communist party of china and the people's republic um there is no like great proletarian social revolution i know the one in russia was kind of not that important but they had one uh, a, a great proletarian social revolution uh, that seems to be actually kind of lacking in vietnamese socialism um 
I mean, we had, you know, like, for example, we can talk about in the 90s in China, the the like restoration of like, well, Confucius is part of our culture. We're going to incorporate it in. And now you will meet like Chinese communist cadres who are expatriates who were talking about like how Confucianism was necessary for a thousand years for socialism to happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, there is an interesting like, you know, you don't have a, I, or I don't know. Let me rephrase that. You don't have like turning against Confucianism the way you did in like the seventies in China. Um, or, or was there, though I just not know something. The, there was, um, there was a, um, an attempt to, um, introduce uh, there was an effort to get rid of landlords to um the, the french had done a lot of the work of eliminating things like polygamy of criminalizing opium of um what could be called the civilizational weeding that um the, took the form of the cultural revolution in china with much more destroyed than that could possibly be justified. Um, so there was less to do in Vietnam. Okay. And the there wasn't the same uh, atheism fixation. Uh, the fact that the exploiters were so closely tied with foreign um, powers meant that it wasn't so much that we were doing bad. It's that the occupiers were the ones uh, imposing exploitation on all of us with some cronies and collaborators going along with it. So you don't have like a like thousand year like religious clerisy who's incorporated all kinds of property and basically feudal landlords or any of that. But in, not because it didn't exist, but because the, the prior co uh, colonizers had already taken it anyway. Yeah, a lot of that had al already been carried out. Um, there was a great deal of resistance um, to French colonial administration on the religious issue because of the work of the Catholic Church. And um, that meant that you had no shortage of um, clerisy, of uh, monks um, and uh, other like religious intellectuals that were um, sympathetic to the Viet Minh and to um, socialist liberation uh, against these uh, outside forces that were trying to not only stifle the economic life, uh, strangle the Vietnamese people economically, uh, alien all of their labor, ship it abroad, but also uh, destroy their cultural patrimony so religion is just regulated by the state but it's like as long as you guys stay in line and don't start preaching anything particularly anti-communist we're going to probably leave you mostly alone yeah th there's actually all kinds of um all kinds of new religious movements uh, i mean don't yeah. they have they have their I've own like, some of them too they they have catholics but they have like syncretic uh Vietnamese yes they do catholic. they well. have uh, there's a there's a Buddhist offshoot somewhere in the south that has Victor Hugo as one of their great saints. That's pretty awesome. Um, I want to sign up for that Buddhist say. Socialist Buddhism in Vietnam. There we go. Yeah. So the Vietnamese, they're doing all right. This is why uh, Kuba. Cao Dai. Cao Dai. Yeah. Cao Daiism. Yes. The. Uh, and yeah, um, the three saints of the Divine Covenant are um, Victor Hugo, Sun Yat-sen, and um, Chang Ching Win Bing Kiem, um, that I'll admit is the one that I know least about. Um, and the covenant is written in um, English, Vietnamese, and uh, in French, sorry, hmm. uh, Vietnamese and Chinese, and uh, French is Dieu et humanité, amour et justice. Cool. Yeah, cool. Uh, exactly. Nothing, nothing in there that I that I particularly object to. These are not the droids I'm looking for. Carry exactly. on. So, 
so one thing I would actually, one of the things I noticed about Vietnamese uh, socialism, though, is they don't mention Mao much, but they mention Sun Yat-sen a lot. Um, is there a particular reason for that? Like, I think um, it's a means of uh, maintaining, uh, because um, Sun Yat-sen is a little like Jesus in Islam. Sun Yat-sen in the PRC. Everybody loves Sun Yat-sen. Yeah, Everybody, I know. Nobody objects to him. And it's a uh, means of finding common ground with the PRC without, pardon the expression, kowtowing to Mao. Um, and so, yeah, so we can mention Sun Yat-sen and maybe Joe and Lai, and we're going to shut up about everybody else. The, they've, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm very sympathetic to an ambivalent, position on Mao. Um, the, especially if you're from that neighborhood, the, um, mm -hmm. and you also don't want the way that, uh, the v uh, Vietnamese communist party secured independence and, uh, consolidated its power. You don't really want a Maoist mobilization effort. Maoism is not part of your plan. Even because. China doesn't want a Maoist mobilization plan these days. I mean, when the Nepalese Maoists, what like one, they were like, "Geez, like it's like, Ooh, oh, guys, crap. what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do with this like Nepalese Maoists?" So yeah. And so, to to bring it to today, um, you have um, the net period is um succeeding developmentally but it's also making um vietnam vulnerable to things like uh, financial crises um export shocks um there's efforts to try to reorient the economy towards more domestic um consumption but at this point they're um, they still haven't moved all the way up the value chain um and they rely on those international supply chains uh, as their means to access um, the technology and some of the material that are essential to further development. Um, they're picking up a lot from China as um, more barriers are introduced to on both sides to uh, investment um, or exports uh, from China. Um, investment into China, exports from China. Um, and there's a very strong division between rich and poor, between foreign oriented um, sectors and the old state economy. But the strength of the party state means that you don't get all of the health services defunded um, and you don't have the total neglect of the countryside. So, uh, one thing about the party state, though, like so a lot of the things we call one party states actually aren't china's not really a one party state i mean it effectively is but it, there are recognized parties within the coalition uh even even uh the democratic people's republic of korea there are recognized sub parties uh and parties other than the, the the official one they can't really do anything beyond the municipal level but they exist uh, do it, it is that true in Vietnam? Because it's one thing I've never found an answer to. Is it really just the Chinese Communist Party and there are no other parties? Are um, the I'm going to Chinese uh, Vietnamese Communist Party. Sorry, I don't mean to slander the the good people of of uh, Von showing Vietnam. his racism right there. He, he he's like so they're, um, all, they're all the same to him. Uh, they definitely are not. But okay, I had to. I had to look it up because, um, as you said, sometimes you have these minor parties that are uh, tolerated for one reason or another. The um, People's Republic of Poland had a number of minor uh, parties that, that they existed to give a patina of democratic legitimacy to mm -hmm. what was a party state. Mm -hmm. um, Vietnam is just officially a party state. It's just the Communist Party. Yeah, so, uh, so there really is, they, there's no even like, like we're not even letting municipal people. It's democratically centralized single party state. I guess yeah. that's you, there might that's be competition. Russia. I mean, yeah. that was the USSR. Yeah, I mean so. that's that's what would be interesting is like how much internal comp uh, competition is, is much, there? 
There's probably a ton, yeah. Yes. The, for instance, uh, on geopolitical and economic policy, there's a, a pro-Western and a pro-Chinese um, bloc um, that um, get balanced in order to, to maintain a, um, you know, a neutral friends with both sides uh, overall orientation. Um, mm -hmm. There's um, a military industrial complex. I think Vietel is owned by the armed forces. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also large private enterprises, foreign and domestic, that uh, are becoming influential in their own right. The um, They're not necessarily powerful within the, the Communist Party. And the Communist Party has a bit of a Red Prince and Hanoi Center problem. Uh, mm -hmm. They're... Um, David, they're officially making efforts to try to um, introduce more women and more Southerners into uh, positions of authority. There's four, um, there's like the four top spots. I think it's chairman of the party, prime minister, president, and speaker of the parliament. And I believe the goal is at least one woman, at least one Southerner at all times. Um, but um you they, tell me they've gone doing, woke. They've gone woke. I mean, I knew someone's gonna say that. Yeah, there we go. We they, have to say it. Well, good on that. Good on. Good well, on the run. right now it's all four northern men, right? But like, oh. that's the goal. That's the goal. The goal. They, right. Hey, it is aspirations. They they had it. They broke it open before, and they're saying that this is just a trans. It's a rebuilding year. They need a good point guard, right? Like, didn't they uh, just recently redo their constitution too? Like in 2012 or 2013 or something? I, I don't know. Okay. The, um, I can't. I can't go into detail on that. Um, okay, that's okay. Constitutions. I mean, yeah. in socialist states, kind of like, matter, but not really. Like <laughs> exactly. The what's more important are the um, economic plans and the administrative blueprints for the party. Yeah, and the party uh, laws. The the part the rules for the party really matter, and the constitution of the party really yes, matters. Yes, precisely um blank thought right like mm -hmm. that's that's significant as well but the constitution of the state it's a little like um the paper that you have to submit in order to demonstrate that you're un compliant right like we are a real country we have like a constitution with the laws about how we govern ourselves in it you know please give us the seat um, but <clears throat> it's, uh, there's, uh, it, it's a country with a tremendous amount of potential. And when I was there recently, I felt a real sense of, um, relief and nostalgia at being in a place which believes in its own future. Yeah, that's, that, that, one of the things about being back in America, it, it actually has affected me. It's like no one here believes in anything. It feels it feels very 1970s, 80s, the way people describe the USSR. Uh, when I was in Korea, uh, South Korea, admittedly, but people, I mean, they thought their government was corrupt and full of shit, but they still believed in their own future. <laughs> and like, I, th I hear that's changing there, but... Um, I've, I've only heard good things about Vietnam and my, my, my one experience, which was very slight. It was a few days, but, um, and Vietnam, I mean, Vietnam is, as I, as I say, out of the existing socialist states is one of the more defensible projects. I mean, they've done okay for themselves. They have, you know, outside of the war economy, they've like done some growth. They've managed to avoid any great leaps forward uh or like and, and i think that one one good test of a country's uh diplomacy and its regional role is do any of your neighbors like you yeah that's a good point and and the cambodians don't well i mean you don't. know to be fair they have reasons but but the laotians do mm -hmm. and the fact that you you have one um neighbor with whom you have an unequal relationship. That's actually pretty cool with um, how well you're doing, just wants you to be happy and wants to learn, um, speaks well of um, the Vietnamese. Yeah. 
And the Vietnamese put an end to the barbarism of the Khmer Rouge. Like, I think uh, that's one of, they did a good deed for humanity. Oh, absolutely. As as much as these idiots who are reviving Khmer Rouge apologia, uh, I see online, it's like the Vietnamese did, you know, as good a humanitarian military intervention as any Western government could dream of in putting an end to the Khmer Rouge. No, uh, soon reminds us that they actually did have a minor great leap forward, but it was not as long. Um, yeah, so. it was. Um, and the, unfortunately, it was also um, targeted against the Chinese minority because it coincided with the worst tensions, uh, the worst sino Vietnamese tensions. Oh, well, people are asking, if people are going to ask me the two actually existing socialist states I'm going to defend is going to be Vietnam and Cuba. With with some caveats on both, there's cap, like everybody's got, like I'm no actually existing socialist state is perfect and I have to like talk about Cuba's messing up of the AIDS crisis. I mean, but... technically Laos is a socialist state. Oh I yeah, Laos is fine too. Yeah, Laos is fine. Yeah, Laos, Cuba. Cuba, Cuba is fine. This... Yeah. It's like I would rather wish live him well, in Cuba. you know. Wish him well. I'd rather uh, live in Cuba than in Haiti. I personally sometimes I'd rather live in Cuba than in here. But the um, <laughs> there was a like uh, a Canadian comedian suggested that um, we actually merge with uh, Cuba to form a new nation called Canuba, um, and we would have the United States surrounded. Um, which is, you know, like it's a good it's, one. Yeah, it's, it's a good, good one. one. Yeah, it's a good it's one. Dad it's a, humor. It's very, very Canadian humor. Anyway, but, you kind of did merge, didn't you? I mean, Justin Trudeau is basically Castro's son, isn't it? Not impossible. Um, to be fair, right? Like trading Pierre for Fidel as dads is a lateral step. <laughs> um, the they're both remarkable political leaders. I know I'm going to get a lot of heat for that. But um, the within their systems and their times, uh, well, they do a lot of good. Well, C- C- Cuba and I know someone who went to university and was fairly close with Justin Trudeau, and we can I can reveal to you that Justin Trudeau definitely took cocaine at university. That is a confirmed confirmed. He also did a lot of blackface, but that's uh, now I, public. I, I, I to, also, to be fair. Not the blackface, but the cocaine was provided to him in his orientation package when he arrived first year. All I all I have to say is, as long as we're praising pr- uh, Pierre and not Justin, I'm okay. Like <laughs> Justin, uh, yeah. Nepo minister is 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 not my fave, but um... and apparently when he was at university, he ha- said he had no political ambitions. <laughs> So that tells you tells I mean, you what I don't think he had any political ambitions until he got sworn in. Uh, and then it's like, oh crap. Castro family, Trudeau family, Castro family, Trudeau family. It's all but... one. It's just one big family. <laughs> it's probably you know, it probably was like literally, it was probably <laughs> Pierre was like, Hey Castro, you want to go twos up on the misses tonight? We, it's the sixties or seventies or eighties. And he's just like yeah, let's get, let's fucking do it. Let's go. Let's go. Let's let's smash it up. And is uh yeah, it's and I bet it happened like at the UN building. Okay, this is this yeah is too, too yeah, much save of my it for the fanfic. Save it for the fanfic. <laughs> okay, guys, we've been going for an hour. We've been talking about Vietnam, but it was good to discuss Vietnam because I feel like uh, definitely just doesn't get as much glamorous play on the left uh, to think about. It. This country. In some ways, it's overlooked because precisely because it's successful. And yeah. success, when you realize how modest success actually is, how many problems are still there, um, then it can be demoralizing. And it's especially for sort of like uh, young people who want the great rupture and the um, full revolutionary transformation um it's more attractive to look at uh, doomed causes that yeah. um, promise the world than guys that are you know 
the hard hat, the lunch pail socialists, right? They're just going in every day. They're doing the best job they can. They're making it happen. Not these flashy hip hop style socialists. Exactly. Right. Vietnam is just quietly getting on with the job of trying to survive and improve people's lives. Did they do an end zone dance in Pyongyang? No. I don't know. Actually, probably. But like that doesn't change the fact that they're in there every day doing the work. That's true. They're doing the work. So uh, everyone, here's, uh, here's to the Vietnamese yeah. workers Cuba, and peasants. Cuba's advocacy for norm core socialism is... Uh... Is some norm, persuasive norm core socialism, <laughs> yeah. Um. Norm core socialism, and with norm core socialism, uh, I guess we're gonna have to call it an evening. Cooper has to get to bed so he can go do war crimes in the morning. Vaughn needs to get to bed so he can wake up and record a video of him screaming at you for being a bad leftist. I and also I have, have to teach classes, but that's okay. <laughs> you have to teach classes. But you need to get all the yelling out first. I actually think there's a connection between those two <laughs> two things. Like yelling at people on YouTube is a good way to prepare. To not yell at kids. kids. Oh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Listen up! You call this coloring in the lines? <laughs> oh, do you, do you, no one would let me teach small children. <laughs> like, come on! Like, uh, like, pick one up, choking him out in front of the others, just to. <laughs> I taught get sixth you grade for cool one off. year, and it was never. Yeah, I was like all these, but any any child between the ages of ten and fourteen is a kulak. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Well, guys, with that lovely point from Vaughn calling tweens kulaks, we are out. out.